It is an honor on an ongoing basis to know that he is our bishop and our covering and that we do this with, with his help and with his support and his servant's heart and all of those things. And so, Todd, thanks for being here. And we just welcome, why don't we welcome Todd to come and she share. It's lovely to be with you uh, in Comox. And um, we've been working toward this start for some time. And I wish you could have seen a little video, our congregation in Lethbridge, our, our whole service uh, today rose and prayed for this. And they took a little video of probably 500 people just cheering and, for, and praying for Via Comox. And uh, they sent it to us this morning just to let uh, you know that they're behind you. And, and same thing with our congregation in Regina and our budding congregation in Calgary. There are, there are lots of prayers going up for you and, and a lot of people supporting what's happening today. I'm particularly appreciative of those who have come from other churches because it's such a beautiful statement of unity in this area and commitment to uh, one another's growth in the gospel. And so thank you. How, maybe I could just see a show of hands. Um, how many people have come here in support, but you've actually come from another congregation? Wow. Okay, so now hold them up there for a minute. So if you're part of Via Comox, I want you just to maybe stand up and turn around, and I want you just to appreciate this picture. That is amazing. What a statement. In, 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 our, in our city, when church plants start, I always do anything I can do to, to support the church plant. I, I've never thought of a church plant in our city as a threat to us. And, and numbers of times the church planters have said, you give us more support than our own background, our own tradition, our own denomination. And, and they're always in and out of our building and using things and we just love it. Because there is more people in, in our small city than we can reach as a congregation. And we are way better for one another than we would be alone. And, and so for, to be able to come today to a people who believe that and actually practice that, there's a lot in Canada of people who, who, who would maybe use that type of language. But to, for you to be able to put um, your actions behind that uh, means so much. I'd like to take a reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke today. And it's to uh, share a few things that would be fitting for today. Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to read from verse 16 and following. It's a parable of Jesus, our Lord. Jesus said, a man once gave a great banquet, and he invited many, and at the time of the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field. I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go and I'm going to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and yet still there is room in your house. So the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, compel people to come in, because my desire is that my house would be filled. And we'll end that reading right there. Last night we had the pleasure of being at Will and Heather's house, kind of a dessert evening there. It reminded me of this parable because the parable is about a man who gave a great banquet. And I was able to see that in this group of people, they, they like their food. <laughs> and, and, and last night it was a little bit, it was like a banquet. There, there was very fine food. I was beside myself. And, 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 and it was plentiful, and desserts of every kind. I could probably spend much of the sermon just describing them individually, if you'd like. But, but, but I'll use my time otherwise. But I could say, these people like being together. Uh, they like feasting. 
And, 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 and Will and Heather, if I ask them for, for anything, do you have something? I can see they love serving. They, they love hosting a feast. They, they, they love putting on a banquet. Their joy seemed to, 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 be to, to make me happy. And so, so I think that in some ways this parable of Jesus is especially relevant to this group. The parable says that the master sent out his servant to invite people to his banquet. So there, there was a lot of preparation went into this banquet, a lot of heart went into this banquet, but yet it yielded surprising results. In that, those that were invited didn't want to come. So when you hold something, I'm there. I, I, from anywhere. I might even come just especially for that. I even actually thought last night the food was so good, I thought of relocating my base from Lethbridge to here. <laughs> Quite seriously considered it, actually. <laughs> just making up, I don't know, some spiritual reason why <laughs> a new church plan needs my work help support more than an established work. That could sound quite convincing. But, but, but it actually had something to do with with a very, very different reason. They, they invited people who didn't want to come. They didn't outrightly say, I don't want to come. But what they did amounted to that statement, which is to say they made excuses why they didn't want to come. So there were some people, one man in particular was invited, and his excuse is, I, I don't want to come, I, I can't come because I bought a piece of land. So. So why? You, you want to see a piece of land. You want to see it do what? Because that land has been there a long time before you purchased it, and it'll probably be there for a long time afterwards. In other words, there was nothing whatsoever urgent about seeing that piece of land. Just an excuse. The next person who was invited to come said, I, I, I can't come either. I'm afraid I've bought some, some oxen, and now I must go examine them. And of course, Jesus' audience knew that he's saying this tongue-in-cheek, because who buys oxen and then examines them? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you examine them first? And, and, and then buy them? So Jesus is making a point here. The third excuse is, I've married a wife and I cannot come. Of course, the audience thinks, what kind of wife did you marry? So again, he's saying something tongue-in-cheek. He doesn't even say, please excuse me. He just says, I just married someone. She is not going to let me to come. But of course, why didn't, she just, why didn't he just bring her? And so they, in one accord, they make excuses. So the master of the banquet changes his plans and changes uh, the charge that he had given to his servant. And so instead of inviting that first group, who probably consisted of friends and family, if you read this parable, and in the light of the few verses prior, it's about people who only invite friends and family to come to special events. So instead of that, he throws open the net. He, he opens wide the doors of his home, his hearth, his heart. He opened wide, wide the door and, and cast the net so much wider than he'd ever cast it before. And in some ways, he's, through this simple parable, he's speaking to the heart of God's people. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, whose original call, Genesis chapter 12, was to be a blessing to all the families of the world, not just to their own family. They, they were called to be people who, who cast their net very wide, whose door was open to all peoples, and yet seem to continually forget that significant call. Now faith had become more of a family affair. They lost their concern for those outside of their family and outside of their family of faith. And the church through the centuries is, has often done likewise. Kind of forget who the church was for. Kind of forget who we're inviting. Who, kind of forget who the banquet is for. And, and so we, we have done similarly at various times in church history, which is why it's so easy in a church to look around and just see friends and family. But when's the last time a, when's the last time a new person came along? And so there's a few things from this parable that I want to bring to you via Comox. A few things I hope you could maybe take away from this parable. Number one, if we're not careful, we could repeat the mistake of this parable and only invite friends and family to via Comox. 
But with this opening service, there is a change taking place. Up to this point of time, you have been building a wonderful sense of close community. But today you add something to community, you're adding mission to that. So, so community and mission, there's an interesting dance between the two of them. And, and, and we are called to do both. And, and there's a tension in between them sometimes. But there are many ten tensions in the kingdom of God that we are called to do. So you've build, been building this wonderful, tight sense of community. And the challenge is, the better you do that, you can find yourself thinking, well, I don't want to invite just anybody now. They could spoil our sense of community. But with this opening service, you're saying, we will continue to build community. But we're also going to reach out beyond our community not just to friends and family, in other words, not just to people just like us, but we are going to do outreach and we're going to reach out to this valley. That raises the question, mission to whom? Well, in this parable, it's a mission to the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. You know, when I first came to church, I'd never been in a church till I was 13. I didn't grow up in a family of faith. But at the age of 13, my parents began to investigate the Christian faith and began to bring me along to church. And so guess what? I was the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Why was I poor? Because I didn't have anything to bring. Now, now someone quickly made me the sound man within the first couple of weeks. I didn't even know how to operate an AM radio, but someone wanted out of a job. And so anyways... It was a small soundboard, but, but the truth is I really didn't have anything to give. This, that, that people gave to me, and, and I felt it. I, I, I grew up in, in an alcoholic home, a home, a home where alcohol had done a, a, a lot of damage. And, and so, uh, particularly my father, um, you know, family gatherings or places he would take me to, I wouldn't exactly say that there was a safe feel to those places because men, when they're drinking heavily, aren't at their safest. I still remember what I felt like when I went to church. I, I, I couldn't understand what was being said. I couldn't take in a sermon. But there was a safety. And, and, and I remember, particularly from the men, who as a young man would come up and tease me a little and... and Pat me on the shoulder and get me going. And, and, but they weren't unsafe. I, I still remember the feel of going to church, not being able to understand what is church about it, had no spiritual kind of frame of reference. And I had nothing to give, but they began giving to me. Don't underestimate uh, what, what, what recognizing someone, what remembering their name, what, 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 a, what a pat on the shoulder. Uh, what a little bit of teasing and fun can do. When I was 13, 14, 15, I had nothing to give, but the church of Jesus gave to me. And guess what? That church that I came into, never, having never been in a church before, that's the church where I'm now pastor. If you had told me at 13, one day you'll lead this place, I would have think that would be the most ridiculous thing in the world. And yet in God's providence, a church loved me well, and now I'm doing my best to love them. So I was the poor. I was the crippled. I was injured by life. Life had had an effect on me. I, 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 I wouldn't have been able to see it in myself, but I'm sure I was careful how, let, how close I would let people come. So the poor, the crippled, the blind. Not only was I crippled, but I was blind to my own cripple. I, in other words, I was probably careful how, how close I would let people come, and I was blind to the fact that I was even doing that. It took me a lot of years and a, and a lot of healing to even realize I would have been doing that. So, so this is the people we're called to reach, people like me, lame, people who, who couldn't get there spiritually without some help. They couldn't even get there on their own steam. I remember, like, 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 Today, there was, young people were allowed to go, and so the youth in this church um, were, were whisked off to another room. There was only three of us. And, and so I remember their, their youth pastor, I think they called him, saying that we're going to do a sword drill. But I didn't grow up in the church. I, what is a sword drill? Sounded like it had some form of bloodletting involved. <laughs> so, so, do you know what a sword drill is? I didn't know what a sword drill was. It was... It was, he would name a book of the Bible, and the, and the first person to find that book of the Bible would win something. But I'd never put my nose in a Bible. 
I didn't even know the Bible consisted of books. But here, I was 13, 14, and he said, the winner of the sword drill, I will take across next door for a Dairy Queen ice cream afterwards. And that's all the incentive I needed. So I asked him, how would you know the books of the Bible? Where would you find? And he said, well, there's an index in front of your Bible. I, got, I deliberately got him talking so that I had the time to find that and read this, and I memorized them, and first Sunday in church, won the sword drill. <laughs> because I wanted that ice cream bad. <laughs> Wonderful memories. So here we're being called to reach out to the poor. You're, you're going to invite people to come, and, 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 and they, they're not going to feel like they have a lot to give. And that's okay. You're going to invite the crippled, people who have been injured in life like the rest of us. So, so they're going to walk in with, with a bit of a limp. I, our, our church, we're known as being a very, very welcoming place. But, but it, it's wonderful when I go to welcome someone, and, and their body language is saying, stay away from me. They've been, they've been hurt by life, and they don't actually want to be that warmly welcomed. So we res- respect that. And, and it's not our first rodeo, so I understand that li- life damages us. And so sometimes even warmth of welcome is hard to take. Sometimes even real genuine love can be hard to swallow. So the poor, the crippled, the blind, in other words, you're going to see things about them they can't see in themselves. And you can't even tell them, but you can love them until a stage where they'd like their eyes to be opened. And they're lame. We, we run four city buses, or four, two full-size buses, and I think one or two smaller buses. We have four buses just so we can go pick people up and bring them to church. So I actually take this quite seriously. We're called to go into the highways and byways and bring people to church that can't get there themselves. We run four buses on a Sunday. Bring people by the dozens. Particularly, we have a, we've really enjoyed uh, reaching out to our um, immigrant community. I've spent most of my adult life, having been raised in Canada, living in other countries. So I know, I know what it's like to be that guy from another country. So when I moved back to Canada after 18 years of missions, and I, I felt really strongly led to reach out to the immigrant families in, in our church or in our city, excuse me, and just one of those, just one little story, but uh, from the moment I heard that the government was putting Nepalese-speaking families in our city, I I knew that was meant to be a mission for us. And so that's who our buses collect. And so that's been running for about three years now. For the first year and a half, we probably have about 125 Nepalese-speaking people in church, of which 90% of them were Hindu. So we would run, about quarterly, we would run a a special service. 250 of them would come. Again, of which probably 85, 90% weren't Christians, they were of another faith. And so there's amazing that one out of every three people in our church on a Sunday was not a Christian. And we, it was the most incredible sensation of bringing the gospel. Now many, many, many of those people have been baptized and they're just, they're just coming to faith by the dozens to know Jesus as their savior. And the, the Nepalese community just love us as a church. When they run their annual event, they bring me or someone from our church and they, they always give us some kind of a war, reward or award because they feel so deeply loved by the church of Jesus. And that, that now there's Nepalese speaking communities all across Canada who say, why have you got such a great treatment in Lethbridge? And so even though the government put them in another city, now they are now relocating to Lethbridge because they feel like they could get that kind of treatment. It's just pure fun. What's what's there about that not to enjoy? Oh, the story, I I just, there's so many stories I could tell you. I mean, the, the feeling of, in prayer, laying hands on a Nepalese family, who in in their entire lineage had never had a Christian ever lay hands on them and pray. The feeling of that. And the healings, the miracles we've seen. Incredible experiences. 
And so when the church engages in this kind of mission, realizing we invite certain people to come, they didn't come, so we go to the highways and the byways and we look for those that are, are lame and blind and crippled and people that can't get there on their own steam. And you're, you're entering into a world with Jesus right at the very heart. You're actually doing the very kinds of things that Jesus is most passionate about. And it's completely contagious. Last thing. Remember, you have a destination in mind. In this parable, there's not just a going out, but there's a coming back in. You go out and find people, and there's a bringing people back into the master's house to eat of a great banquet. I, I've seen things done in so many ways. I've seen those who meet in the master's house, but never really go out and do anything, never really want to invite anybody in. I've also been part of huge evangelistic organizations where there's always a going out, but there's, there's never a bringing people back into the Father's house because there's been a loss of faith in church. So some people just wash their hands and say, I'm just going to go reach the world, but I don't really want to bring people back to church, and it never works. I've been doing this for almost 28 years. Because even if you have a success, your success quickly turns to failure. You know, because... People need a family to belong to. I've also seen us go out and bring people back in, but when we bring people back in, there's no banquet to eat. So we bring people back, back into an empty dinner table. That's not much fun. And so via Comox, here's three things I ask you to keep in mind. Number one, let's love mission. In this story, you're not the people eating the banquet, you're the servants. You're not the people eating the banquet. You're the people serving the banquet. You're, you're Will and Heather last night. You're hosting the banquet. You get to watch people come in who have never seen food like this and who have never eaten that heartily. And you get to pull up a chair and say, let me serve you. You're about to eat the meal of your life. So we, we love, love, love Mission. God has not brought you to Via Comox just to eat a banquet, but to serve a banquet. Number two, let's love the master's house. We've got to have some place to bring people back to. The reason last night was so fun is because we were in your house. And so your house represented your, your heart. You were not just inviting us into to, to, to timber frame. You were inviting us into your home, into your heart. We ate in the context of your heart. And that's, that's why as soon as I went in your house, I could pick up sense and care and love and conscientiousness. And didn't I ask you, what's, how come I smell Christmas tree, but there's no Christmas tree? It was a, it was a wee candle she had burning. Tricky. <laughs> so, we, so we love the church. In, in an age of skepticism with church, if... We absolutely love the church, the bride of Christ. And we will bring people to be part of his church. And number three, let's love mission, let's love the master's house, the church. Number three, let's make sure that there's a banquet available when people do come. When people come, that there is a veritable banquet, a lush banquet of love, and of kindness, and of healing, and of deep care for people. Let's make sure it, the spread is big. Last night, I, I was still hours later leaving, and the food was too good to only have one helping. It would have been disrespectful to you. What, I just want people to come and go, I never had a meal like this. These people, you can just... It's just a feast. You can just, there's love like you could never keep eating. You can, you're just never ending. Like, there's kindness. There's God's presence. It doesn't matter how much you worship, you want to worship more. Let's make sure there's a banquet available when people come. Hmm. A banquet for people to enjoy. A banquet for people to eat heartily of. And if we keep those three things in mind, You won't be able to keep people away. What did the servant say? 
He says, we've brought him lots, but it's still not quite full yet. What did the master say? Then go it again. What does he say? Because I want my house full. I want my house full. I want this banquet to be enjoyed and participated in. So this is a good place to start. It won't be too long until you won't be able to fit in this place. Why? Because you'll be too full. Too full. Hmm. I'd like you to bow your head in a word of prayer with me, please. And I say this to the Via Comox, and if anybody else wants to join in, there's a commitment that our hearts are making prior to a commission. And via Comox in your heart, will you commit to those three things? Number one, I will, love, I will learn to love the blind, the lame, the crippled. I will love them. My prayer is, Lord, love people through me. Via Comox, there's a prayer to pray. I am not being drawn here only to eat of a banquet, but to serve a banquet. Number two, I will love the master's house. I will love his church. It's his house, the place where his presence is. And I will build his church and make her glorious. We will adorn her with good works. The book of Revelation says the bride has made herself ready. She has adorned herself with white linens, which are the good works of the saints. And number three, we will make sure a banquet is here for when people come. A banquet of love and kindness, of interest, of authentic relationship. That from the first greeting to the height of our service, the Eucharist, the Lord's table, That we can say along with Isaiah the prophet, come, you are thirsty, come who are hungry, come without money or price. Come and you will be filled. With that in mind, I'll turn this over to Chad to introduce the commissioning part. Thanks, Todd. Um, We just wanted to take some time as a community to um, kind of officially commission the church and to say the doors are open. And uh, I couldn't think of a better way than to do that than in prayer. And so I've asked uh, Todd if he would come and and just pray. And I'm going to ask Jan if you'd just come join me. And I think the two of us will just kind of represent uh, for all of us or the crowd gets pretty big up here. But um, if you're part of our community, especially just join your hearts with ours and We're going to ask Todd if he would come as our bishop and just as part of VIA, pray a commissioning prayer over us. Uh, And then I'm also going to ask, when Todd's done, we're going to ask uh, Scott to come. Scott is the pastor over at Northgate and a good friend. And he's going to come and just pray over us on behalf of the valley and and the pastors there. And and when he comes, we would love it if if you're a pastor here today, if you would come and join him and just uh, kind of pray over us. Again, it's been uh, mind-blowing to me to see a community so open to say, you know, go for it. It's not even just, yeah, it's okay if you're here, but like cheering us on and just excited to see that. And so uh, it feels significant today to have um, that invitation for commissioning both in the sense of who we are as a part of a movement, we're part of something bigger in that sense, but also in the way that we are something part of something bigger in the valley. 
and we get to join Jesus in what he's already doing. And we just have a clear sense of that, that we don't step in to start something he's not already been doing. We just get to come be a part and play our, play our part. And so, um, yeah, Todd, if you'd come. And... Maybe you'd join me in our custom, if you feel a level of comfort. And that is, you'd maybe just extend a hand in the direction of Chad and Jana. And maybe just before I pray, and even as I pray, you, you would whisper a prayer of blessing from your church, from your family, from your business, from your heart. Pray a prayer of welcome, welcome them into this community. So we said a church plant is not a threat. It is a gift. And so there's always a receiving of a gift. I want you to think of your church family and what is it that you have to give? There's areas every church are particularly strong and gifted in. There's a redemptive gift, sometimes many more than one in your church. So pray that on them. What is the unique gift that Jesus gave your church and gave your family? You have a unique authority to release that blessing on them. And so as you continue to pray, I say, Lord, we receive these blessings. There's blessings being prayed right now over their finances as a church, over, over, the, over their marriage, over, over their family unit, over their safety, over their health. We receive every blessing and give it a landing place. Jesus said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. And so just even now under your breath, say that blessed are they who have come in the name of the Lord. Father, I thank you for Chad and Jana. I thank you that the gospel that was delivered once for all, the eternal and unchanging gospel that was given from Jesus Christ, the only Son of God to the holy apostles of old, and was handed down generation to generation by the church with great care and conscientiousness. And now it has fallen on Chad and Jana, on their team and the other churches of this valley, to be faithful with that gospel, to reach this valley. We pray that they would be able to say, with Jesus their Lord, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. And so we, re we open the very windows of heaven in Jesus' name and pray that that sovereign spirit would descend at the hands of the ascended Christ. The sovereign spirit would come okay. and fill Chad and Jana and those that will join with them we ask for the signs of the sovereign spirit being with them. Things that could only be explained in the terms of God's sovereign power. Thank you, Jesus. And that by the power of that sovereign spirit, the good news would be preached yeah. to the poor, the lame, the blind, the crippled. Those that are, those are broken in heart would be healed that broken places would be, would be raised up. Yeah. 
ascended Jesus. Send afresh the gift of your spirit. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That they would be anointed for this task. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. The, their sails would be full of the wind of your spirit. And so we release you to this task and release the Holy Spirit to fill you. We trust your leadership and trust your character to build Christ's church in Christ's way Thank you, Lord. and to reach Christ's world. Yeah. Hallelujah. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray these things. Amen. I can invite some of the other pastors from the valley to come on up as well. We're going to stand around Chad and Jana. And I think you both know this, but we do certainly want to echo it in this setting is welcome. You know, welcome to the valley. Welcome to what God is doing here. We stand with you, support you. In a, in a wedding ceremony, you know, the, the man and woman stand there and it is about what they're launching into. But part of it is we say, you know, that those of us who've gathered are here to say we're with you, we're for you, we're going to rejoice with you and bear burden with you and stand alongside. And as we gather around you today, we want to say that as representatives of uh, Christ Church in the Valley that uh, welcome and we're here to stand alongside you and just look forward to all that God has and uh, one other thing I want to do before I prayer prayer commissioning is just commend you and as uh, Todd as you said this that the wind of Holy Spirit would fill their sails we're we're at a prayer retreat a group of us earlier this week and one of the pictures that was given w which was for those who were there but larger was of a, of a harbor and, and a dock and, and, and a sailboat at, at the dock but with its sails fully up and, and rigged and, and the sense was that there, there was a preparation for the wind to blow and it was both an invitation and also a commendation that, that people had, had got their sails ready. And, and as you guys, have, you're launching out today. You, you've done that. You've rigged your sails and, and put them fully up. And you've said, we're, we're ready. Via Comox Valley, we're ready. We purchased sound systems. We've done this. We've gone, we're ready. That uh, The wind, not that it hasn't yet blown, but we're just absolutely ready and expectant for the wind to blow. So for all of you that make this your church home, I just want to commend you for rigging your sails and saying we're ready we're ready for the wind to blow because it is going to blow it's going to continue to blow and this is going to be amazing and so and even for this comox valley so let's just pray and again stretch out your hands as you feel comfortable father we do. We, we rejoice in the work that you are doing lord lord i thank you for the privilege we have lord of recognizing what you have done recognizing who you have called recognizing who you have anointed and equipped and commissioned and launched out and father thank you for the privilege we have of fellow shepherds standing alongside chad and jan and this team and just recognizing what god is doing recognizing the good work that god has begun and standing alongside them and affirming with confidence that you who began that work will be faithful to complete it and we're just going to journey together lord as your work is continuing and carried on in the Comox Valley. So we do, Lord, some of the songs and the declarations that have already been sung in this place this morning, we just echo them back to you, Lord, that you would do something in this group for the sake of those who don't yet know you, for the sake of the world, for those who haven't yet gathered at the banquet, Lord, that you would do something in each person in this room that would be so uh, reflective and representative of the life of Christ, that those who haven't yet gathered at the banquet would be compelled to and drawn in to come to your table and feast at your banqueting table. 
table. And Lord, as has also been sung, Holy Spirit, come and rest in this place. Lord, that this would be a place, Lord, this physical space, but our hearts and every place and space that we would occupy would be a space that is filled by the presence of your spirit. Lord, in coffee shops and workshops, Lord, and workplaces and schools and wherever it would be, playgrounds, that is the members of this family, your body, go out into the Comox Valley, that every space they occupy would be space that is filled by your spirit, where people are compelled to come and eat at your banqueting table, Lord. So we thank you for them. We commission them, Lord. We, we pray your prayer that you gave uh, Aaron to pray, Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. Lord, that you would bless and keep this family. That you would make your face to shine upon them. That you would be gracious to them. Lord, that you would lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. And so, Lord, we bless them. It is our great privilege to stand alongside them and to gather under the wonderful name of Jesus and to declare that name to this Comox Valley and beyond. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.